Well, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Shilton, as someone has said, and I'm the careers manager for science and engineering. And I'm delighted to be joined by Barry Carruthers um, from Scottish Power. Uh, just as a kind of preamble, um, I've been given a script to, to talk to here, so I'll just talk to it and then we'll go on with some questions. Um, there is a booming UK-wide hydrogen economy, and that could create about 9,000 apparently high-quality jobs by 2030. Um, and apparently, hydrogen could play an important role in, well, it's, it will play an important role in decarbonising polluting energy-intensive industries like power and heavy transport, like shipping, lorries and buses. And we, had, and we, we have got Ian War with us, who's Director of Engineering at First Bus, who are going to be who are moving to hydrogen buses in a, in a big way. Uh, but he's not able to join us just yet. Hopefully he will be if we can get the tech issues sorted at his end. So I wanted to chat to Ian War and to Barry. Uh, and if you like to have the idea of somebody who produces the hydrogen and somebody who uses the hydrogen. But if we don't get Ian, that's fine. We'll, we'll talk to Barry about hydrogen in general. I'm sure you'll be fine, Barry, with that. And we'll, we'll see how we go on. Um, so um, Barry it directs Scottish Power's activities in hydrogen across the UK and Ireland as part of a global hydrogen division within the Iberdrola Group. If any of this is wrong, Barry, just correct me. I'll do it. This focuses on the production of green hydrogen as a complementary method of decarbonisation alongside electrification solutions. Barry is one of our own. He graduated from the University of Glasgow in 2003 with a first class B engines in avionics. And um, is that correct? Yeah. That's right. And you actually won the Royal Aeronautical Society Prize, I believe. That's yeah, good. that was. That, uh, I made up for it my fourth year for how bad I was in my first year. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, and then you followed by postgraduate research in autonomous flight control and algorithms for unmanned air vehicles. So to go from that to hydrogen is a really interesting journey, and I'm, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. Um, so maybe would it be would it be okay if you maybe just gave us just a brief. Um, career history, if you like, and maybe talk, talk to us about some of the highs in that, if that's okay. Yeah, I'll fill in some of the gaps, absolutely, okay. between those uh, long, dark days in Oakfield Avenue and those PhD offices. Uh, and yeah, un you're right, unmanned day vehicles at the time, and we are talking, when is that? 2004, something like that, uh -huh. uh, to 2006-ish. Uh, that was kind of at the start of, kind of unmanned day vehicles. We were looking at quad rotor uh, unmanned day vehicles, but at the time, it was all about uh, autonomous search, so using things like uh, evolutionary algorithms, genetic algorithms, uh, so that there were basically uh, no pilots in the loop. So very much the kind of thing you see today, but obviously over 10 years, everything's miniaturised. Mm -hmm. So that that was, yes, it had military applications, but we were looking at things like uh, disaster zone recovery, uh, search methodologies, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So really interesting stuff, uh, but I guess like, like some people, not all people, but some people... I just got commercially restless. <laughs> uh, I want to, uh, I could already see in the, the early days of kind of PhD studies that a life in academia was not for me as such. And I was really, really interested in the commercial side. Uh, I wanted to know how business was going to work and what I, what I should do. So uh, I actually went straight to a startup company, which was funnily enough, a spin out a uh, company from Edinburgh University. Mm -hmm. And I was focused in vibration and control, which was, you know, uh, kind of my engineering background through control really mm -hmm. uh, which then that four person startup and I was the fourth person in door we grew that up to about 20 25 people ready for acquisition by a, a, another company uh, so that company's still going but then the four of us uh, split off again to then go and start an engineering consultancy mm -hmm. that was when we kind of uh, kind of took the reins off a wee bit really and started to look at renewables such a such a fascinating area when you look at things like wind turbines at the time uh, tidal turbines, seabed mounted tidal turbines, the engineering that goes into that, uh, the marinization, the control, uh, the optimization, everything that you know you can you could fill your engineering boots with at that time. And that's what really got me hooked on renewables. So I went from very quickly being a, a MATLAB geek to being a spreadsheet monkey trying to make things work uh, financially right into on-site project management, including uh, ab sailing out wind turbines to look at blades and on-site project management, living out on-site for six months. It was just unbelievable. I would, if anyone gets a chance, uh, there's always value in being part of a startup company at some point in your life. Because uh, we did everything from capital raises to board 
uh, presentations to marketing materials, client interactions, technical delivery. It was just a fascinating time of life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did get hooked on renewables. Uh -huh. And so that's when I, I kind of felt like I wanted to be part of something that was building the renewables. And that's when I made the jump to Scottish Power Renewables. Mm -hmm. So that took me into marine energy. And again, very much at the vanguard of tidal turbines, uh, wave energy. I, then I spent a bit of time in onshore wind innovations, offshore wind. Uh, so that was all kind of renewables focused. Really got my uh, got my kind of interest going in the mix of engineering and commercial, because one does not happen without the other. And so that for me was a really important kind of initial five years in Scottish Power to to work out. Well, yes, we build the projects. Yes, we procure the equipment. We need to optimize the equipment. But actually, if you don't have the commercial side spinning the financial appreciation of what engineering decisions mean financially, then actually you, you're, you're never onto a winner. So that was a great education for me, which then led me into corporate innovation sustainability, which would include looking at everything from blockchain to, well, everyone has to look at blockchain at some point, don't they? Otherwise, uh, you know, you're, you're not with the buzzwords of the day. Uh, electric vehicles, battery storage, uh, heat pumps, and of course, hydrogen was always on the, the horizon as something that, that we should consider getting involved in. Mm -hmm. And then a year ago, we decided, I should say a wee bit, one wee step back from that. I'm talking about Scottish Power here, but uh, for anyone in the audience who's heard of Iberdrola, that is the global energy company that we are part of. And Iberdrola is active across, well, most countries in the world, actually, uh, North, South America, uh, obviously mainland Europe, uh, Asia, Australia. Uh, so that global energy company approach meant that, of course, hydrogen is something that we should be looking at within our strategy. And because we have renewables, uh, which creates the electricity, we have the customer base uh, in energy retail, and we have the networks infrastructure as part of our skill base. Mm -hmm. That is basically green hydrogen and what we call green hydrogen. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a, a fascinating last 12 months, a uh, busiest year of my life. Right. A very exciting place to be because you're at the forefront of technological innovation, but also policy innovation. Uh, and trying to create a, literally trying to create a sector, I wouldn't say from scratch, because we shouldn't forget hydrogen has been around for hundreds of years. And actually, a lot of the supply chain components are there ready to go off the shelf. Mm -hmm. But we're still trying to do some new things. So it is very much about an emerging sector, creating everything from government ties to brand new companies. Uh, and just doing doing a, a new way of uh, business and a new product to try and help that decarbonisation scenario. Mm -hmm. So uh, finally, I guess I would just say, why does hydrogen matter and why are we doing it at all? Mm -hmm. We've all got that decarbonisation challenge and the net zero challenge, and it is a race to zero, we shouldn't forget. So electrification is absolutely what we should do. 80, 90% of what we need to do across society will be through electrification. That is electric cars, heat pumps, uh, more renewables, of course, but that 10 to 20 percent of society will be hard to use electrification either because you can't, for example, use an electric boiler to get up to 2000 degrees Celsius. At some point, you need to combust something that's very, very good. Uh, but also, we use molecules in refineries, chemicals, feedstocks, uh, aggregate industries you name it. We actually need molecules, not electrons. So, therefore, having a clean gas, a clean molecule, as green hydrogen is, that lets us tackle the last 10 to 20 percent. Yeah. And therefore, we've got all the tools in the box to really tackle decarbonisation here on. And that's that's how we've landed today. So that's brilliant. Um, but now, somebody who's got, a, I've got a vague scientific background from decades ago, right? So I, I'm thinking, right, how do you produce, produce the hydrogen then? You can do it from organics, right? But you can also electrolyze water and do it. So tell me, how, what direction are you going in with that? Yeah, so we are we're 100 percent green hydrogen, completely focused on that. Uh, again, you'll see lots of news articles talking about different colours, a full rainbow of colours, obviously. Uh, some of them fairly obvious when you talk about black and brown and the associations with coal and using fossil fuels for that. Uh, pink's a funny one, where, where essentially you're, you're, you're using nuclear uh, energy for that. Uh, but green and blue are the ones that you'll see fairly commonly referenced, uh, and grey. So grey basically is based on fossil fuels and taking natural gas and using steam methane reforming uh, to extract the hydrogen. 
but that has incredible levels of CO2 emissions associated right. with it. For for around one ton of grey hydrogen, you're making around nine tons of CO2. Right. And that is the vast majority of hydrogen that's used across the world today. Yep. Blue hydrogen is an improvement on that. So that's where you start to use carbon capture, use in storage, uh, a bit like the, the kind of uh, projects you might have seen in the news this morning or, or, or yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, so that carbon capture technology uh, should be a really exciting technology for the future, mm -hmm. but it doesn't capture all the CO2 emissions either. Mm -hmm. It does have, uh, well, one, we haven't really seen it work at large scale commercially and technically, but if it does work the way that it's meant to, yes, you can capture 85, 90, maybe even 95% plus. Mm -hmm. But that, but those small percentage emissions really do matter because they are large projects and they'll be operational for many years. So we yep. do need to be careful because there is, you know, there will be millions of tons of CO two associated with blue hydrogen uh, projects as well. Mm -hmm. But for us, our focus is race to zero. That means a hundred percent renewables, which is our generation portfolio. So we used to have coal plant, we used to have gas plants. We don't anymore. We're hundred percent renewable generation, mm -hmm. and that means that we can take that renewable electricity. As you say, you bring in electricity in one wire, you bring in water and a pipe into a piece of kit called an electrolyzer, and what you're doing is separating uh, into both hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. So zero emissions associated with that process, and that allows us to get clean green hydrogen. That's completely our focus, and one of the great, well, yeah, one of the many great things that I like about that is the modularization of that. Electrolyzers are a uh, an interesting space to be technically they are uh, i mean there's innovations every single day as you'd imagine not just economies of scale but actually step change in technology itself mm -hmm. so that gives us a really good trajectory for the future mm -hmm. but at the same time because they're modular in nature that actually allows us to cater to different customers different scales of projects but also be geographically diverse and we quite often uh, hear the phrase just transition and for me that also means that people in rural parts of the country, not just in Scotland, but actually anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. uh, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't miss out on decarbonisation because they're at the tail end of the electrical infrastructure grid, for example, mm -hmm. and they can't buy an electric car or they can't get an electric heat pump or they can't benefit from low carbon hydrogen because they're not on the gas system. So what you can do with green hydrogen is plonk it wherever you need it. And it's the same with small scale renewables, medium scale renewables. You build where it's required, and what that does is unlock places like coastal towns, rural environments, agriculture, uh, distilleries is a great one, a personal a personal passion of mine. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so I just like the I like the fact that it's a bit like starting with a single wind turbine, but then going and building an offshore wind farm. Mm -hmm. At some point, you know, it's all modular, <laughs> build out about you get economies of scale but also you can build it where you need it. And that's why it's really closely aligned to our business model. Brilliant. You know, it's funny. I, w I, I was talking to a student uh, the other day, giving her some careers advice, and she was telling me that her, her project was on working on iron molybdenum nitrate catalysts for electrolysis to try and get the the efficiency of it up, to, you know, up, up nearer to 100%. Obviously, if we got 100%, that'd be fantastic. Um, I don't know what the percentage is at the moment. What is what is the kind of going? Do you know what that is? Yeah. Well, I mean, yes. Yeah, it it obviously, depends on what on what type of electrolyzer and and also which manufacturer you talk to. But mm. uh, I mean, they are very good. Uh, you're talking about somewhere in. As soon as I say this, somebody will write <laughs> and I've got it wrong. I mean, it, it varies. The truth is, it's varies. So it's a, it's a wee bit of a kind of politically good answer to say it's somewhere between. <laughs> Somewhere between 60 and maybe 80 percent, something right. like that, in terms of efficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere mid range is probably more realistic. Mm -hmm. But we are the point is we are seeing that improve all the time. And one of the most important things that we're doing is improving that efficiency because the amount of electricity you put in is the single biggest driver to the cost, mm -hmm. the effective production cost of that hydrogen molecule. Mm -hmm. So yes, capex has an effect in how much kit you have to start with. Uh, but actually, the single biggest driver is your your electrical input. So therefore, the more we do in terms of getting the cost of renewables down, we reduce the cost of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. The more we increase the the efficiency and performance of the electrolyzers, the lower the cost of hydrogen as well. Now, both of those things are heading in the right trajectory. 
So that's that's what gives us you know very good confidence for for that being a really cost effective zero emission solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's really brilliant. So you've only been in this role for a year then, and you said it was the busiest of your life. So could yeah. you talk to, could you talk us through what kind of things what what are the challenges that you've and I know you've had a whole career before that, but we're talking about hydrogen today. But so what what have been some of the big challenges, um, and how have you kind of addressed them? Yeah, well, I mean, it, let me think. Within the last four years. Uh, I did a three-year MBA as well as working at the same time with the right. uh, University of Strathclyde and Comillas in Madrid. So it was an international MBA in, in global energy. And I thought that was busy because uh, that was very much working nights and weekends for, for anyone who's done that. You know, the I thought when I left university, you know, uh, my days of writing the essays were behind me. But no, 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 no. Uh, once you start learning about uh, strategy and organisational uh, strategies, before you know it, you've written 20 pages of A4 and you've got hand cramp like you used to have during, during undergraduate exams. So that was busy, but I'm glad I did it. In incredibly glad I did it because starting a new business unit a year ago, it's amazing how much I relied on those MBA courses. Everything from setting your own strategy, your own trajectory from ground zero, uh, how to recruit, how to build up your organization capability, how to do market assessment, uh, what are you going to bring to the market, value chain analysis, do you have the right supply chain partners, alliances, how do you balance the risk of money that you're about to spend versus when you think you'll, you'll be able to get that return on that money later on. They, to me, previously were probably all quite abstract issues that you know people sitting in suits and ties would worry about and not me when I was abseiling down a wind turbine. <laughs> but, but the reality is, uh, the past year, as you say, has been starting a strategy from scratch, uh, talking to everyone from customers to government ministers to doing media to internal organisation about budget planning, uh, looking into technical diligence. Actually, do we have the right partners? Are we building the right types of projects? And every single day will be a single, uh, a, every single bit element of that. Uh, I mean, this morning I've been talking to customers. On Friday, we've got a uh, big media announcements to do. Clearly, there's a lot of policy work to do every day with government to make sure. I mean, they need advice from industry as to what they're doing. Yeah. And when you have all those pieces, you turn around and you say, well, who's going to help me build these projects? So then you're talking to engineers, you're talking to finance people and saying, do we have the right team? Uh, show me what the project looks like. Show me if you think there's technical risks that we need to invest in here. Uh, and then, of course, you're doing financial appraisals all the time. So that, for me, has been just, yes, it's been busy, but it's also been the most phenomenal year. And I should say my kids are now seven and nine, so that's, that's that I feel like I've, feel like I've graduated from uh, those early days of, of uh, young children. I don't know. I don't know how you get time to to pursue your distillery passion. Is that is that something that has to, to go in the back burner? If I can use that metaphor. No, I've had to mix business and pleasure there. I'm afraid. Okay. So, uh, no, and and in very in very real terms. I mean, one of the first things that we got involved in was looking at hydrogen to supply distilleries who have very high energy demand, uh, and for many of them, as I say, the back to the geographical and diversification uh, point that I made. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are on the outskirts, obviously, of uh, rural locations or at the edge of the electrical infrastructure in grid network. So a lot of them might have a historical reliance on fuel oil uh, <coughs> and and heavy uh, heavy fossil fuel reliance, which might have come in by tanker, by road, and not sustainable. Uh, and the, the Scotch Whiskey Association know that. So that's why they set themselves as an industry very strong targets so actually, they do need help from uh, electrification solutions. They need help from clean gases like hydrogen. And so actually working with distilleries is one of one of my day-to-day -day, uh, pleasures. Right. And I, I mean, I suppose I will get back to asking more sort of career-related questions in a minute, but I'm just really interested, and I suppose a lot of us are, what do you think, I know it's a tough question, but you're, 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 you're in with politicians, you're, you're doing all this work. What's your... What do you see Scotland's future in terms of exploiting these the hydrogen um, potential then of Scotland? Do you think we're going to do it, or do you think there's challenges? How do you see the future going? It's uh, it's inevitable because it's required. Mm -hmm. I think it's different 
Uh, so if I play back a wee bit in the last 10 years when we were in the, the marine energy space, and that was I was completely focused on that tidal energy, wave energy, that was a new technology uh, for electricity generation, uh, which actually does have complementary benefits to things like solar, onshore wind, offshore wind, and it will have its place, absolutely, but that, it's still on that technological uh, innovation trajectory right now. Mm-hmm. Whereas where I think hydrogen is, it's filling a void. Energy wasn't there. Uh, it's trying to compete, and quite rightly so. It's finding new areas to go into uh, in new applications. But we do need molecules. Uh, we can't. We're not, we can't fully decarbonize purely on electrons, and therefore there is no choice in using hydrogen. It is going to be a component part of our energy system, mm-hmm. of our society, and by that I mean on very real terms. Uh, you're not going to drive a lorry from London to Inverness anytime soon on battery power. Mm-hmm. Uh, so actually, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Yeah. Uh, there are certain elements of train and the rail system, for example, which cannot be electrified. That will be uh, hydrogen uh, rail transport. Mm-hmm. And of course, the big ones, shipping, aviation. But actually, you do take hydrogen, but then you start to move in derivatives of, uh, like ammonia, uh, liquid organic hydrogen carriers methanol for example these are all you know these are all incredibly valuable low carbon fuels for the future for loads of different applications which are absolutely required if we still want to have ships if we still want to have trains aviation uh, long road transport for example uh, we actually do need hydrogen and therefore the necessity makes me believe that of course we'll do it mm-hmm. one of the one of the great things we have in scotland uh, is the growth of renewables mm-hmm. And therefore, the more we build renewables, uh, the cheaper and more available hydrogen will become. And that unlocks things like hydrogen bin lorries. You know, we don't need to have big diesel vehicles driving up and down our streets. Mm-hmm. Uh, we should all benefit from cleaner air. Mm-hmm. Yes, we should make that electric wherever we can. It's far more efficient to have an electric vehicle than a hydrogen vehicle until you reach the point of range, operational requirements, total cost of ownership. And then at the higher end, it becomes hydrogen. But we, we deserve, we all deserve that cleaner air for the future mm-hmm. uh, from our industry and our transport. And that, that demand is what's going to mean that hydrogen absolutely will and does happen. So going forward then, um, hydrogen itself is going to be more relevant for big transport things like heavy lorries, planes, ships, and maybe for smaller cars, batteries might be the way ahead, or rather than hydrogen fuel cells. I don't know. What do you think of that? Absolutely. No, I think anything small, light, medium is likely to be electric and should be because you're talking about, uh, you know, whenever you convert electrons to molecules, you've got conversion losses, Mm -hmm. clearly. And then when you go from molecules, so hydrogen going into a hydrogen fuel cell, uh, you're still essentially driving an electric motor at some point. So you've you've lost so much energy, it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So I mean, my, I had a, an electric car myself for three and a half years, and I'm just waiting to get a new one, hopefully in January. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll never go back. Uh, to and, and hands up, I actually do have a diesel car as well. Mm-hmm. But over the years, it's done less and less miles. It's constantly sitting at home. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've driven an electric car everywhere. So there's no going back. It's, it's a phenomenal piece of technology. And actually, they're improving all the time. Mm-hmm. So there's really no, there's no great rationale. Uh, to think about trying to force hydrogen to areas where it shouldn't be used. Mm -hmm. There's great rationale for electrifying, as I say, 80, 90%. Mm -hmm. But there will be limitations as to the higher end of transport, there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. And I should say also in industry as well, you know, transport's one of the things that we're all going to see very quickly. So you will see, uh, and in case Ian joins us, I'm (laughs) certainly not going to steal anybody's thunder, but you will see hydrogen buses, you will see hydrogen lorries, hydrogen trains, and we should all be we should all be served by those, mm-hmm. but actually industrial applications where they require on natural gas right now, or yep. even better if they use grey hydrogen right now, we should be converting those companies and those industrial processes to green hydrogen, yep. and we'll all benefit from that as well because those those kind of CO two emissions associated with that are an order of magnitude more than, for example, transport emissions. Yeah, no, that's really 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 interesting. It's really interesting and, and it's just the rate of change is just phenomenal then, isn't it? So what do, what do you think, what implications do you think that has for, for the skill sets of people required to work in 
and we've got lots of students obviously here today thinking about careers in renewables and in energy and all of that. What implications does it have for this kind of skill sets that we need? Yeah, uh, and it's, it might sound like a bit of a cop out answer, but it's genuinely not because uh -huh. uh, I didn't do standard Greek chemistry. Never mind anything beyond that. Uh, so I still I still need people to explain to me certain molecules and uh, what kind of uh, chemistry codes I'm looking at. But the things that I would really, really say to everybody is you are working with sustainability. You just don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. Every single organization that you go to should have some sustainability focus or core. Now, it might be on the technology side. Uh, it, might, it might be in a, a finance institution. Uh, it could be an educational institution. Everyone is going to have sustainability targets, and rightly so. Mm -hmm. So I would really, really struggle to bring people into my team now that didn't get the net zero challenge. And oh. by that I mean, by that I mean, uh, what are we doing about it? What is going to make a difference about that? Because the truth is that is where future growth businesses will be. And if you turn up and say, "Listen, leave me alone. I just want to code. I want to program," uh, and you know, I don't really, I don't really get the bigger context as why we're doing it. You're heading in the wrong direction, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Now, this is this is not just technical teams. This is right at board level. They are going to be looking for people who get the climate change agenda, but are able to make future value out of that agenda. Mm -hmm. So that will be the growth of renewables. It will be growth of things like green hydrogen. So technology solutions for climate change is a great place to be. But there's also everything in there about customer behavior, uh, analysis, data, uh, in the way, you know, the kind of things that we are used to seeing now, you know, analytics and bots, whether it's a, a telecoms company or an energy company, you know, there's so much customer behavior analysis in there as well. So the software skills as much as hardware technology, it's all sustainability. It's just that it's not called that in many ways right now. But when you look at teams that are being built, mm -hmm. uh, organizations that are being formed, startup companies that are happening, everybody has to be thinking about what does my business look like in 2050? And therefore, everybody should be thinking, what does my career look like in 2050? And that's why I think uh, anyone who's got, anyone who makes the effort to understand the climate change agenda and necessity, what their role in sustainability is, whether it's on the technical side or finance side, and unfortunately, some people need to be lawyers and accountants, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> but, but even they have to be involved in organisations that have a sustainability focus or target or some kind of business value. And so that sustainability knowledge is the first thing that I would ever look for, because mm -hmm. you can always train people. You can always bring them into your team and educate them in what the business is doing. Mm -hmm. But we don't have time to sit there and tell people, here's the wider context. That's for people to bring with them. And then the second thing really is about a uh, commercial nuance. And, and let's just let's just call it uh, I, I refuse to say team team player. Because that's just, <laughs> I, just, I don't like that. <laughs> But an, an employable an employable teammate, let's call it that, yeah. because we've all worked with people uh, in the past that are just incredibly difficult to work with. And the truth is, all that does is slow you down. Mm -hmm. It slows down projects. It puts up barriers that you don't need. Now, I don't mean everybody has to agree, not in the slightest. Just you're not a great team member because you simply agree with everybody else. You know, everybody, I'm sure all the audience know about all the different personalities you need in a team and you need somebody to put their hand up at the end of every meeting to say, wait a minute, guys, I've just thought of something. I think we need to go right back to the start again. That's actually really valuable. But you do need to do it in a way that you're going to be working in a team, workable as a team. Mm -hmm. Because the, I'm afraid the people who struggle to work in that team environment uh, are really, really hard to, to progress with in terms of projects and to escalate through, through an organisation. The people who can take on challenges in a technical sense, but I actually can work with 16 other people in a small room at the same time, they are incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. They are the people that you will build your business around. They are the people that I look to join my team. Uh, so I am constantly looking probably even more at the softer skills than the technical skills, mm -hmm. because everyone everyone can have a great CV. Uh, now, whether it's truth or whether it's lies is not really the point. It's, it's only a CV, mm -hmm. uh, and it's only a degree, and it's only a grade. I would much rather have somebody that I could uh, work with and they would gradually become more valuable over the next 12 months because they're part of the team 
rather than somebody who thinks they're it from the start, but actually they're a wee bit of a kind of uh, a wee bit of kind of thorn in your side <coughs> in, in a team working environment. Now I know that's a bit of a cliche to say all that to everybody, but it's the absolute truth. You know, it's interesting because you know I've been obviously doing this for a long time as um, in careers work, uh, Barry and. The number one skill that employers seem to want, apart from the technical stuff, obviously, you, you know, you need that. But in general, it's a willingness to learn. It's like the ability to actually be self-aware and give a, have an accurate appraisal. So nobody walks out of university an expert in anything. So it's about learning, isn't it? And it's about contributing and being, being humble is a funny word. But you know what I mean by that? Yes. It's, it's about having the humility to say, look, what, what is it we need? I can, I've got ideas, but they might be. But not saying this is how to do it. It's like contributing and making a decision better. Yep. That way. You, get, you get two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> and that, that's exactly it. Uh, yep. Because there's there's times when you know I'm maybe chairing a meeting with a team of you know clever engineers and, and project managers, and I'll maybe not say anything for 58 minutes because mm -hmm. I don't need to. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm there to I'm there to listen as much as anything. I'm not there to tell people uh, mm -hmm. or dictate. And there's also times when you know you know my bosses will sit there and be quiet for a long time because they're there they're there to understand things make decisions make judgments so you're right one of the best things is communication and you can't communicate if you are a uh, lacking understanding in why you're there and what you're doing it because you'll miss the context mm -hmm. uh, you can't communicate well if you're you know head down thinking i'm going to technically deliver my role everybody else will pick up the pieces and make the project happen uh, that communication of making things happen is just such a universal skill that it's, I mean, it's hard to actually explain uh, to people uh, without having maybe four pints and trying to hammer it into them over over a long conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and I know even me sitting here online saying this probably for some people, it might not even register at all. Mm -hmm. But all I can say is it is the absolute truth. If MD had told me anything at the time, uh, well, certainly undergraduate days, was yes, study, perform well, make sure you get the grades. Mm -hmm. But if I had not come out with the grades that I got, I'm pretty sure I could have still done more on my softer side of skills mm -hmm. and I could have been more employable than I was at that time. Mm -hmm. I was very fortunate in the trajectory I went through of the startup companies and things like that because I learned all that. Mm -hmm. But I kind of think if I had come out, let's just say fairly techy in terms of good grades at the time and gone into a large company, mm -hmm. I could have probably sank into a, an engineering wilderness almost and become a a one of a 50 person team mm -hmm. whereas going to a startup actually brought me out my shell a lot i had to present i had to talk to investors who were sitting there ready to invest millions of pounds i had to talk to customers the first week in my job in my first company i went to malta all by myself right. uh, to do a, a, a vibration monitoring uh, project for a client so i was right into the thrust of talking to clients who i knew had to pay the invoices mm -hmm. had high expectations of an engineering consultancy Mm -hmm. And I had zero warning about it. Now, if I hadn't had that, I could have easily just carried on that kind of techie trajectory and never really built up those softer skills. So I would genuinely say that to everybody. Now, it might be daft stuff like, I don't know, joining uh, joining clubs, mm -hmm. doing social things, things that I didn't really do well enough in undergraduate because I had my group of friends I didn't, you know, uh, that was it. But actually, when I look at people's CVs now, I do look at the, you know the wee bullet points at the bottom of the CV? Uh -huh. Like, I was involved in this, uh, you know, I did this, I volunteered in this. That shows actually they are more than just the bullet points in the grades above. Actually, they've got a wee bit more about them. And that just means they're more likely to be functional in a 10-person team, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to ask you questions there, Barry, about, well, how do you actually convey that? How, how can students... Oh, yeah. Ian's with us. How can you actually? We're just about to finish, Ian. I'm so sorry. I, I know. I, massive apologies. Um, no, IT it's issues not, that I just couldn't resolve. It's, it's, it's not your fault. Just give me two seconds and I'll, I'll, we'll get, get to you. No, I was just saying that, you know, it's those softer skills that are important. And you've just, I, I was going to ask you how to how the students convey that. And you've just, you've just answered that question. Uh, and really, it's, it, it is a great time to wrap up. I'm so sorry, uh, Ian, that it's taken us so long to get you here with us. But we've, We've had a great chat about hydrogen, and I've even asked some questions about electrolysis. I've never done that in a careers, in a careers uh, chat before. Um, and you know, so um, Barry's making the hydrogen and come up with green ways to make green hydrogen. And you're obviously in first buses, ready to 
to uh, use that in your or you're using it in your bus fleets. I right. can't just cut you off. We must give you a chance to speak. So um, for the sake of the students here, could you just tell us a wee bit about what you do, how you got to where, you're, where you are just now and what you look for, what you think you're going to be looking for in the future? So I suppose if I could sum that up, how did you get to where you're at just now? Where do you see the future of hydrogen in your industry? And what do you look for in recruits when you come in? That's a three-pronged question. If you can answer that in a bit in a few minutes, that'd be fantastic. Sorry to throw you in at that. that that's fine, and hopefully you can all hear me now. So, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, how we got here today was part through a um, initiative called the Jive Project, which is European Commission-based initiative funding hydrogen vehicles across Europe and many different deployments of which Aberdeen City Council were keen to get involved in. So we, we have been participants in that program for a number of years now, operating a number of different uh, fuel cell vehicles in deployment in, in, in Aberdeen. Um, most recently, 15 of the latest generation, um, sixth or seventh generation fuel cell from Ballard, uh, fitted on right bus hydrogen um, fuel cell vehicles. Um, so we, it's it's been a long and arduous journey, but um, certainly um, we see the future of hydrogen as, as being a main player in the uh, sustainability agenda. Um, really, we we you know there is a couple of big issues to to overcome in terms of hydrogen, and they are commercial issues. So I won't dwell on those. But hydrogen, at some point through volume, will become a, a significant player in 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 comparison to electric vehicles. Um, and, and we're very interested in, in deployment of more hydrogen vehicles to make sure we can fully test and evaluate them. Um, and that opens up an array of needs for, for new skills and new, new knowledge. Um, the, the technical aspects of fuel cell technology and the way that's delivered and the chemistry behind all of that, of course, not just from a hydrogen perspective, but also the battery capability means that we're absolutely looking for more academic uh, astuteness in, in evaluating technologies and making sure that we future proof our, our business and operations to, to make sure that we can you know, effectively run these vehicles, mature the technologies and work with the supply chain to make sure that hydrogen becomes a mainstay player in the road to zero emission vehicles. Hopefully in you know, sort of two minutes, that's, that's given you a, a flavor. Okay, that's great, Ian. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to call it to a close because we have got something else at two. Um, I'm sorry, Ian, but listen, if anybody's got any questions for you, you know, we can we can send them on to you. Um, I just think it's been a it's been a fascinating chat with Barry about hydrogen, and and I've certainly, um, I mean, I do. A way way back in 1983, I actually got a chemistry degree, and uh, I should have said that at the beginning. So, but it's a long time since I've used any of it. So I didn't really know about grey, green and blue and pink hydrogen. That's a new one in me. I'll need to go and swat all that up. But it's really, really interesting. And I think what we've had today is a, a fantastic session about the future, about the fact that if you go into this area of, of work, your, your career is future proofed because that's where we're going. Um, and also, I think it's been great just to even touch on the the fact that you need your technical skills. Absolutely. But that on its own is not going to get you to where you want to get to. You need those other softer skills. So I would say to you all, it's been a great lesson in living your life to the full at university if you can, not just doing your degree. I know it's tough and it takes up most of your time, but do other stuff that, that floats your boat, do other things that interest you, and you'll gain those softer skills and have something to talk about apart from just your tech skills. And I don't mean just in a, a disparaging way, but you know exactly what I mean by that. So I'd just like to thank Barry very much for his time and thank Ian as well and apologies again Ian for the, the tech and just um, I just I wish we could all be here together and we give them a huge round of applause because that's what what they deserve for today thank you very much we'll hand over to Simone now to, to just to wrap up but thank you Barry thank you Ian so much and uh, you know hope to see you again wow thank you both oh well, thank you Steve and thank you Barry and Oh, Ian, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it happens. Um, yeah, it was, um, I was very excited to be able to pull Barry and Ian together just to kind of show that balanced conversation of, of one, how how the energy is made and the future of it, and then just the, the kind of practical delivery of it all. Um, so maybe one day we'll get that conversation happening on a, 
on a platform that's a little bit more reliable. But it's been um, it's been really great to hear, you know, um, some of the future and the sustainability roles. And, and I thank everyone for their time today. Um, so I just I think I should wrap everything up. I, I will uh, make an assumption that if some of the students have got any questions for Barry or Ian here, that we can um, we can forward them on on to you, um, and we will receive those through the career service here. Um, the next chat starts in ten minutes. It's with Jeff Greer, one of our alumnus here from uh, and who's working at Airbus uh, in Singapore. Um, so uh, yeah, he's got a great uh, great chat, and he'll be joining us from Singapore. Um, and then um, my, my baby, the big brave, uh, will be delivered uh, at three o'clock. Um, and it's with another alumnus, Carol O'Farfa, who's um, delivering uh, energy in, in Kenya and um, a big promoter of female engineers in, in, um, in Kenya. So real fascinating chat that Stephen's going to have with Carol at three o'clock. So please do join us for that as well. But again, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks.